so my name is Alex Leong. Uh, I am from Buoyant, uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, Linkerd. Um, this is going to be a pretty hands-on, pretty interactive uh, session. So if you've got your laptops and you want to follow along, um, there'll be instructions for how to do that. And I really encourage it, because it'll be more fun, and I think you'll get more out of it. Um, <clears throat> so just by a show of hands, how many people have already heard of Linkerd? Uh, a few. And then uh, of those people, has anyone tried it out? Given it, a, given it a spin? Not really? OK, great. That's awesome, because that's what we're going to do today. Um, so like I said, my name is Alex. Um, I work at Buoyant. I work on Linkerd, um, which is an open source project that uh, I'm really passionate about. I think it's really cool. And I hope uh, by the end of this session, you guys will think it's really cool, too. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you like. Um, so. I'm going to start by talking about uh, Linkerd at a really high level and explain kind of what it is and why you should care about it and what it's good for, what it's useful for. Um, and I'm going to try and go through that pretty quickly so we can go right to the uh, tutorial. Um, and so if you want to get that um, kind of loaded up and ready to go, um, you can go to this uh, GitHub repo, and there will be all the instructions for you to follow along. But we can, uh, we can talk a little bit first before we get to that. OK, so what is, what is Linkerd? What is this thing? It is a service mesh for cloud native applications. OK, what's that? Um, that's a lot of buzzwords. So what is it actually? Uh, it's a layer 5 proxy. So it's an application that runs alongside your application and uh, proxies requests uh, that your application wants to make. So if you want to make a network call, you want to make an HTTP call, or a thrift call, or a gRPC call, you send that call to Linkerd uh, instead of the final destination, and, and it will proxy it along. Um, it's a layer 5 proxy, which means it talks these like high-level languages, high-level protocols like HTTP and HTTP2, um, not raw TCP. So this is not just packets, but this is uh, requests and responses. So these kind of atomic units of you send a request, you get a response back. Um, that's the unit of communication. Um, it's based on an open source library called Finagle. Uh, it was originally developed at Twitter and now sees use at a number of really large companies in production. Does huge amounts of traffic every day. Is very battle tested, um, very production uh, tested. Um, but unlike Finagle, it's not a library. It's a standalone process. So this runs. Uh, separately from your application, um, alongside it, and you communicate it, communicate with it uh, over over the protocol, whether that's HTTP or HTTP/2, um, or or Thrift or gRPC. Okay, so why why do you want this thing? Why introduce a separate proxy into your system? What's the point? Um, well, as we move to more decoupled applications and we decompose things from you know, a single application that's running as a single process to you know, uh, service-oriented architectures or microservices where you have a number of different services that live in scheduled environments like Kubernetes or Mesos, things move around and things become more complicated. And so you need to take care of service discovery. Your app needs some way of knowing where all the other services uh, are currently running and how to send traffic to them. And so that's one of the things that Linkerd does, is it will keep track of, of service discovery. It'll know where everything is currently running. And you can send your request to Linkerd, and it will appropriately route it to the correct location. And that's a piece of logic that you don't need to build into your application, because it's not really part of your application. It's, it's kind of an infrastructure concern. Um, you know, in a similar vein, you're going to be running multiple replicas of all your services for, you know, uh, for reliability and uh, for scalability. Um, and so, of course, you need to load balance over all of those. And load balancing, you know, is a simple, simple in concept, but can be difficult in, in reality because you need to determine how much traffic do you send to each replica. What do you do when certain replicas start becoming slower? What do you do when certain replicas start failing? Um, and so, by building a lot of uh, really intelligent load balancing into Linkerd, you can really bring down your tail latencies by routing around slowness. So when certain replicas become slow, you send them less traffic, you route to the faster ones, give the slower ones some time to recover, you know, back traffic off of them, and let them you know, come out of whatever problem they're having, whether it's GC or whether it's network congestion or you know, noisy neighbors. Um, 
retries are something that, you know, in most systems you probably want. You probably don't want to just give up at the first failure. Um, but retry logic can sometimes be a little tricky to get right. Um, so that's another thing that when you move it into a separate process whose you know, sole purpose is reliable communication, it's one less thing your application has to worry about, and it's something that you know, Linkerd is built to do well. Um, similar to, to, to load balancing, uh, circuit breakers allow you to cut off traffic to endpoints that have become unhealthy. So if certain replicas start failing for, for some reason, um, you're gonna, your success rate is going to hurt as you send traffic to those. So if you can cut traffic off there, route to the healthy replicas, uh, then your success rate is, is not going to suffer as a result of that. Um, so that's you know, an absolutely like, really critical aspect of reliability is to be able to, to be able to handle these kind of failures. Because you know, as things become more complicated, these failures are, are inevitable. You know, things will go wrong. And then it's crazy to, to, not, to run a complicated system or e even a simple system and not have you know, observability into it. But this can be hard to do. You know, you're going to instrument your app, perhaps, but it's, you know, you're not necessarily going to instrument it with all the possible pieces of data that you want. Um, if you have multiple applications running in different languages, you'll probably be using different uh, libraries for metrics in each one. You won't get a uniform view of your entire system. Um, what's nice about using Linkerd is that once you're sending traffic to it, it will collect a huge amount of very, very rich data um, and expose that. And it does this uniformly across all of your applications, you know, regardless of what language each of them is written in. So even for polyglot applications, you get this uniform view of, of the traffic flowing through your system um, at the request and service level. So you know how many requests, what's the success rate, what's the latency on a per-service basis, who's talking to who. Um, you know, it really gives you a rich uh, idea of what's going on. And distributed tracing is also part of that. Um, you want to be able to see how requests are flowing through your system. You know, where is the slowness coming from? You know, the more components in your system, the more difficult this is. And, and that's where distributed tracing really becomes super useful. Um, of course, building that into your application can be you know, annoying or difficult. The libraries may or may not exist in the language you're using. Uh, so I think that's a really compelling reason to put that logic into a separate proxy that runs alongside your app. And it does a whole bunch of other stuff, too. Security, timeouts, deadlines. Uh, there's lots of really, really nice features that can really benefit you when you're running you know, a complex application. Um, but you don't necessarily want to build it into the application itself. You want to focus on, you want to focus on the app and what it's supposed to do, rather than the network communication layer. And it's complicated, right? All of these problems, you know, they're solvable on their own, but they can be a little bit tricky to get right. And you know, they may. Uh, take a few attempts. They may, you know, cause outages or incidents if you, you know, had a subtle, a subtle bug. Um, and you sh really, realistically, shouldn't be reinventing this wheel every time. Uh, and that's why we think it's really great that we can rely on a library like Finagle that's been so heavily tested, um, and you know, we know that it's, you know, super solid. So by relying on that and give, putting that everywhere in your system you get this really, uniform, uh, this really uniform way of dealing with, with network communication. And you do it in a way that's out of process so that you can use it across your whole system. Um, and you don't have to reinvent that wheel. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that Linkerd is a service mesh. Um, and that's kind of a term that's becoming more popular. Uh, you may have heard at GlueCon, uh, Istio uh, launched their service mesh for Kubernetes. Well, we've been talking about service meshes for a while. Um, so what is a service mesh, and, and where does that term come from? Um, the way we think about it is that Linkerd should be part of the infrastructure. Um, all of these network uh, concerns, your app shouldn't have to deal with. So when you do something like run one Linkerd instance on each host in your, in your application, uh, they kind of form this, this mesh through which network communication happens. So your application just has to send its requests to its local host Linkerd, and then that request will kind of go to the, to the Linkerd on the destination host, and then finally to, uh, to the application. And so all the cross-host traffic is handled and wrapped by Linkerd. Um, and, it, and that's where this like, concept of a mesh comes from. What's cool about this is that you get metrics and observability on both sides, uh, so you get you know, metrics from the client's perspective and metrics from the server's perspective. And you can really see uh, 
how things are, are happening and what's going wrong, and is it slow here, or is it slow there? Is success rate different on one side or the other? Um, and you can also, because you're wrapping the cross-host traffic, this is a perfect place to do things like add security. So you can add TLS and encrypt the cross-host host traffic without your application ever needing to be aware of it. And I think that's kind of the big goal here, is that your application shouldn't have to worry about all of these you know, difficult but important network concerns like retries and timeouts and deadlines and TLS and you know, uh, observability. You should just send your requests and, and Linkerd should do the right thing. And that's the idea behind the service mesh. And this works really great in scheduled environments. Kubernetes, uh, for example, you can deploy Linkerd as a daemon set. It goes across every host, one on every host, and, and it's just there. It's just part of the infrastructure, and you can use it and take advantage of it. OK, so now that we've kind of talked about a little bit about what it is, let's, let's try it out. Um, so if you want to follow along, you can go to this GitHub repo, and there will be instructions, or you can just follow along on screen. Oops. Hey, is that big enough? Everyone can see. Let's. OK, um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create um, a couple of services just running in Python uh, in order to demonstrate how we would use Linkerd to, to talk to these services. So in this example, we're going to be running everything kind of locally on, on my computer or on your computer. Um, but in a real setup, we would probably deploy this to, to Marathon or Mesos or Kubernetes or whatever you are in the cloud. Um, but other than that, it's going to be very similar. Uh, so I'm just going to create two directories, cat and dog. Uh, oops. Uh, and I'm just going to put a file in each one uh, for, uh, for the Python um, services to serve. So if we go into cat, we're going to create uh, index.txt or .html. And we're going to put the word cat in there. And then in dog, we'll do the same thing. Dog. Um, and then we'll just start up a simple Python server. So this is just going to serve the word um, cat. And then we'll do the same thing uh, whoops, to serve the word dog. OK, so we've got two services running. Um, if we curl localhost on port 7777, we get cat. And on 7778, we get dog. So we've got our two, our two instances of the service running. And, and I have them returning different things just so we can tell which one's which. Um, OK, so now we're going to uh, download Linkerd. Uh, so let's go back into that directory. And I've already got Linkerd downloaded here. Um, but if you don't, there's a curl command. They can grab it off of the releases page from GitHub. Um, and Linkerd always needs a config file to run. And this config file is going to configure you know, what it does, how it behaves, uh, and, and how it proxies traffic. So let's go ahead and create that. Um, so to start, we're going to give it a list of namers. And uh, namers are the things that Linkerd uses to talk to service discovery. So if you're running in Kubernetes, you would have a namer that talks to the Kubernetes API, and it's going to tell you where all the services are currently running. Um, if you are in a Mesos Marathon, you're going to have a namer that talks to the Marathon API, and it's going to tell you where everything's running. Uh, it can also talk to console um, and another uh, zookeeper, a bunch of service discovery backends. Uh, in our case, though, since we're just running locally, we're going to use the uh, FS namer. And that just uh, looks at some files on your local file system uh, that list out where things are running. So kind of for the purposes of demo and example. And uh, I'll give it a root of disco. That's where it's going to look for these files. Uh, and then Linkerd needs to be configured with a list of routers. And these are kind of the, the main units of Linkerd that 
accept traffic in and proxy it out. Uh, so in our case, we're going to use HTTP as the protocol. Um, and we're going to create a server that listens on port 4140. Um, and we're going to give it something called a dtab. And these are like the routing rules that tell Linkerd where to send the traffic that it receives. Um, and we're going to just start with the simplest dtab there is, which is just to use that file system namer. Um, and the dtab syntax is a little bit complicated, a little bit tricky, uh, but there's lots of documentation online. Um, and it's really uh, pretty simple once you get the hang of it. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add uh, some telemetry. I'm going to add a uh, something called the uh, recent requests telemeter. And this is just going to keep a log of all the recent requests, uh, just kind of to, so we can see what's going on. OK, so I've got a config file. Um, that's great. Um, now, I mentioned in that config file, I was going to create a disco directory that is going to act as our kind of stand-in for service discovery. And that's going to tell us where everything is running. So let's create that. Uh, so we'll create a directory called disco. Um, and then uh, in there, we'll create a file called animal. And this is our service, you know, our animal service. So you've got multiple services running in your, in your system. Um, this is the animal service. And uh, we're going to list out where it's running. And in our case, we've got two instances of it running, one on port 777 and one on port 7778. OK, so that's our service discovery. Um, like I said, in, in a real production system, you'd use Kubernetes or you'd use console or you'd use uh, a real service discovery backend. Um, but this will serve for our demo purposes. Um, and then let's start up Linkerd. So we just start Linkerd, give it that config file, and hopefully I didn't make any mistakes. Uh -oh. So we can just take a look at this error message here. And we can see that I made a typo here. Um, I said namer when it really should be namers, plural. So we can just fix that up. Whoops. So just change namer to namers and try that again. Uh, oh, and again, I did the same thing. I said router instead of, oops, routers. This is the risk of live, uh, live demos. Uh-oh. <laughs> and uh, server instead of servers. Oh, phew. OK, we're running. So let's try sending some traffic. Um, so by default, Linkerd is going to route based on the host header. So if we send a request, now remember I started up Linkerd listening on port 4140. Um, and if we specify a host header as animal, which means I'd like to talk to the animal service, please, it's going to look up in uh, that file, th that animal file we created, where is the animal service running, and it's going to load balance over all of the replicas there. So if we keep sending traffic, we'll see some cats and some dogs because we'll go to those two different Python services that we, we ran. Um, another uh, kind of cool trick that we can do here is that if we use the HTTP proxy uh, environment variable, then uh, we can just curl animal like this. And that's going to be equivalent. That's going to set the host header. But this is a nice way of integrating Linkerd with kind of existing apps that you don't want to modify. Um, if you just pass in this HTTP proxy uh, environment variable, 
then you kind of don't need to change the code. Um, everything will just pick that up and, and just work. So uh, it just works like that. Um, so let's send some more traffic. Uh, so I'll just start a while loop here and uh, sending lots of traffic to, to the two services th going through Linkerd. And uh, let's take a look at the Linkerd dashboard. So by default, it's running on port 9990. Uh, and this gives kind of a picture of, of everything that's going on in this, in this Linkerd. So we see we're doing about 50 requests per second. Success rate is 100%, which is great. Um, we get kind of this live view. Here are all the clients that uh, Linkerd has provisioned. So right now, there's just the animal client for talking to the animal service, uh, which it looks up in uh, that file system uh, directory. Um, success rates at 100%, which is good. We see uh, a table of uh, latencies here, latency histograms. Um, so really rich data. Um, and then we also see here that there are two of two endpoints available. So we're talking to two services, and they're both healthy, uh, and everything is great. Um, but what happens if it's not great? So let's go back to our uh, to our terminal here, and uh, let's kill one of those services. So we'll kill one of the Python services, and immediately we see we've gone uh, from raining cats and dogs to, to just dogs. Uh, and if we go to our uh, dashboard, uh, we see we're now at endpoints available one of two. So a few things to note. Um, there was no drop in success rate. There were no requests dropped. Um, Linkerd just you know, immediately detected that one of those services was not healthy and uh, just simply used the one that was. Um, and we see that, and we see that it, it knows that there's only one of two endpoints available. Um, and so that's taking advantage of the circuit breakers that I mentioned earlier. Um, if we want to bring the cat service back up, we bring the service back up, and uh, Linkerd should pick that up. And eventually, uh, it'll be sending these probes, these occasional probes, to the service to see is it healthy, is it back, is it alive, and uh, and once it detects that, it should bring this back up to 2 of 2. Eventually. Uh, in the meantime, we can take a look at some of the other uh, things that are in this dashboard. Uh, so this is the DTAB uh, area. This is kind of where we can see our routing rules, and we can see how, how things play out. I mentioned that DTAB syntax earlier. Um, if you give it a service name like animal, you can see exactly how that request is going to be routed. Uh, so you can see uh, that it's going to use that rule from the DTAB that we defined, and then here are the uh, endpoints that it's going to route to. Um, we can also take a look at that, uh, those recent requests that I mentioned. We set up that, that log of recent requests, and here they are. So this is a great way of kind of figuring out what's going on in your system. Um, for all the requests that come in, this is going to show us where they came from, uh, what's, what uh, server they came into Linkerd from, um, and then kind of how that, how that routing happened. So it was assigned to this name, and it was routed to this uh, client, and finally it was sent off to this destination. Um, and if we want to go even deeper and, and see even more in-depth information, um, all of this is coming from those rich metrics that I mentioned. Um, uh, so every instance of Linkerd is going to expose a huge number of, of really detailed metrics about how, how the system is working. So we've got all of these you know, JVM-level metrics about Linkerd itself that, that talk about you know, uh, how much memory it's using and, and GC and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and then we also have all of this uh, client-level and service-level data about connect latency and about you know uh, number of requests 
Um, and here in the load balancer section, we can see that there are two available endpoints. Oh, so if we go back, we would have seen that's back to two of two. Um, and if we go back to our, our curl loop, we see both cats and dogs are back in there. So that's completely recovered. Um, and you know this 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 data is so invaluable for things like alerting dashboards. Um, if you aggregate this across Linkerd's, you get this really really rich information that tells you, at a you know from a, a high level, uh, what is your service doing? Where is the traffic going? Where are the problems? Uh, where is the root cause of a problem? Um, you know, retries, where are retries happening? So it's just it's a huge amount of, of really, really great data. Okay, so that's kind of the tutorial that I wanted to go through. I just wanted to show you how we could get Linkerd up and running, um, how we could send traffic through it, and what benefits it could give us in terms of reliability um, and observability, um, and kind of and and hopefully show you that in, in a cloud environment, you know, that's going to be super super useful um, and and uh, really kind of integral to making things, making sure things uh, can handle failures gracefully and and can reduce tail latency and, and stuff like that. Um, there's lots of places to learn more about Linkerd if, if you're interested. Um, we've got a really active Slack that uh, people are constantly in there asking questions and getting help and helping each other out, uh, which is really awesome. Um, we've got a discourse forum, uh, which is another great place to ask questions and, and, uh, and, and get help. Um, and then I especially want to point out um, that bottom link there, blog.buoyant.io. Uh, we've got a really great blog series. We've always got really great blogs going up there uh, that go really in depth into various use cases. Um, so we've got one series in particular about using Linkerd on Kubernetes um, that goes into a lot of detail with really great examples um, on how you would use it for TLS, how would you would use it to add reliability, how you would do ingress, how you would do um, CI, CD, uh, staging, all kinds of really, really cool use cases. Uh, so I highly recommend checking that out. Uh, give it a read and see if there's anything uh, there that is interesting to you. Um, and then with that, uh, are there any questions? And we have a microphone here, so we'll let me pass the microphone <laughs> to you for questions for Alex. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, one thing is, how does this circuit breaker works right now? Like, let's say if the load is there, okay, can I configure like the threshold values? I see uh, this kind of functionality that is there in Netflix uh, high mm -hmm. and you have a high dashboard mm -hmm. where I can configure the high commands, right? Like uh, if there is a certain threshold of uh, pad request, that's when I break the circuit breaker and then it actually like brings back the commands upfront. So do we have such functionality in this? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it is, it's configurable. Um, in your Linkerd config, you can specify whether you want um, to look at consecutive failures and trigger on that, whether you want to look at percentage of failures in a certain window, time window, or number of requests window. Um, right now, that's configurable kind of only statically in the config file, but that's kind of one of the next steps that we're working on is to, to move that and kind of all the things in the config file really out into an API where these things can be updated at runtime. Another question. Um, you mentioned that when you're running multiple Linkerd um, instances across your environment, do those aggregate into a different control panel or overview, or do you have to go to each one individually, or is that more of an enterprise offering to, to have that window? Um, yeah, so there's a few things. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about today is, is a service uh, that works with, Namerd called, or with Linkerd called Namerd. Um, and that acts as kind of a centralized place for routing policy. So those D tabs that I was talking about, you can store those and edit those in a centralized place, and those will get fanned out to all the Linkerds. Um, for other kinds of config, uh, this is kind of what I what I just mentioned. We're trying to move more and more out of the config file and, and into centralized APIs to give you uh, kind of global control uh, over what's happening. On the observability side, um, what the kind of recommended pattern is is to have something like um, Prometheus or, or some kind of stats scraper uh, collect metrics from all the Linkerds and aggregate those into a dashboard. And we have some examples of that as well. 
Um, it, I mean, in what sense does it work with Cloud Foundry? These, you can run Linkerd kind of in any environment. It's, it's, it's a proxy that will run alongside your app. Um, we have specific integrations for, for things like Kubernetes. Uh, I don't think we have anything specific for Cloud Foundry, but you know, it should run anywhere. OK, any other questions for Alex? Another one in the back. Um, <clears throat> what's your tested scale? It sounds like a, you have to keep a lot of state between all of the processes. So I'm curious as to how wide you can cast this. Um, it depends what you mean by scale. I mean, we have uh, Linkerd's can serve, I don't remember the benchmarks now, but I think tens of uh, thousands of requests per second from a single Linkerd instance. Um, and then in terms of number of instances, uh, we've seen uh, deployments with hundreds or thousands of instances across a cluster. Um, is that kind of what you meant by scale? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay, other questions for Alex? All right, Alex, thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. And I've got uh, these cool Linkerd stickers, so please come find me after and, and grab a sticker. Oh, definitely. And one of the things, I don't know if anybody's playing the bingo game, but one of the bingo things is finding a computer that's got, I think, 10 stickers on it, then you get a bingo thing. So go get one, get a <laughs> sticker. All right, thank you very much, Alex. Let's hear it. <clears throat> okay, we have uh, Chris Guan is going to come up and talk about, I think, what. Uh, a relatively simple deployment <laughs> of Kubernetes. Um, so just um, sit tight, stand up and stretch if you'd like or whatever, and uh, we'll get going in just a moment as soon as we get um, Chris mic'd up. Oh, that's how they do it. Let me turn off. Give me a second. Case like. That's the only other one. Works. Take it away. Take it away. Hello, my name is Chris Gaughan. I'm with Apprenda. Thanks for joining me at Cisco DevNet in this ice box. I don't know if anybody else is cold, but if you see me shivering, it's not because I'm nervous. It is because it is 30 degrees Fahrenheit in here. Um, so today, what I'm going to talk about is Kubernetes and, and, and getting started with Kubernetes. This is part of a three-hour to one-day full workshop that we do at, you know, all across the United States and Europe and Middle East. Um, so I asked them if we could do this here at Cisco DevNet. They said, sure, that's great. Uh, com can you, like, take it down to 45 minutes? So we're going to see like some of the slides that we do during that full day or half day thing. Learn about Kubernetes, the architecture of Kubernetes, where it comes from, the community. And then at the end, I'll link to the workshops that you could go to. Uh, we have them in most cities, including San Francisco. And they're free. They're open source. Uh, we don't you know, do any vendor pitches there. So please join us. And we do them with Cisco. We do them with Google. We do them with Google and, in, and Intel. So who are we? Who is Apprenda? Uh, Apprenda is part of the Kubernetes community. We've been part of the community since uh, March of last year. 
And uh, we do a lot of work on Windows uh, server support for Kubernetes. So we're the ones that are actually trying to move Kubernetes to Windows Server. Uh, one other thing that we do is we host a lot of these trainings, workshops. These are hands-on. You get to install Kubernetes and work with it, a full cluster, not just Minikube. And we do those across the country, and it's, it's really great outreach. Uh, we also contribute a lot to Kubernetes Dashboard, which is the open source UI, the community UI. If you ever use GKE, there's typically instructions to go and use the dashboard. We also have software that sits on top of Kubernetes uh, that uh, makes it a multi-tenant service. And then we have support and service options around Kubernetes as well for those that just want to use pure open source Kubernetes in their, uh, in their environments. Myself, I talk a lot about Kubernetes at Aprenda. You can follow me on Twitter. We're also hiring. This is the one plug that you'll hear today. Uh, so if you are a Go developer, Golang, or you're interested in doing Kubernetes services or Kubernetes development, please email me at cgon at aprenda.com. OK, some questions. How many of you in the audience of 10,000 people, I'm playing it for the camera, are developers? There's lights in my eyes, so between seven to 5,000 of you. <laughs> um, how many of you are in operations? A few, a few, so mostly developers. How many of you don't want to admit that you're in operations, so call yourself DevOps? Uh, the rest, okay, I'm on to you. Uh, how many of you have used Docker or containers before? So it's surprising. I thought in San Francisco it would be the entire room. I thought people would just be j jumping out of the door and saying, oh, yeah, I've done that. Uh, how many of you have used Kubernetes before? One. How many of you have used Kubernetes in production? OK, it's, it's OK to lie. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so what are we talking about today? We're talking about Kubernetes. Uh, this is actually from a poll that a company that I used to work for. I used to be an analyst at Gartner covering public cloud. Uh, this is a poll that uh, one of my ex-co-workers did uh, while doing a webinar. And he asked simply, what did they manage in containers with? What is the audience managing containers with? And the top answer was Kubernetes, uh, which is great. The, the better thing is that the number two answer is actually shell scripts, um, which I thought that actually would be number one. Probably the biggest achievement is that Kubernetes beats shell scripts at this point you know, the, the glue of all enterprise uh, development. Um, as I said, we do Kubernetes workshops across the United States and Europe. Um, if you want to do a workshop or free training, you can request them. Uh, we do them on site. Uh, we do ones that are just in the city that everybody could join, but, you know, follow that URL and uh, request a free workshop if you're interested. So, where are we now? If, for those of you that work in a large organization, you have thousands, hundreds of applications that you've developed over the past 20, 30 years. Uh, but you have this Cambrian explosion of applications that you're currently developing in cloud-native models. Uh, and the number of cloud-native applications that, the div that organiza organizations are building right now just keeps on growing. Um, they're starting off small, but in the future, they'll probably overtake everything that we have currently in our data centers. The other thing that's happening is that a lot of these technical decisions on what they're going to be using to build cloud-native applications are coming from the top down. It's no longer IT making all the decisions on what server you could use or where you actually host the application. A lot of times it is line of business developers saying, I want to host this in some public cloud and use this software as part of the architecture of my application. So how did we get to this point where there's such a dichotomy of our internal IT operations and uh, developers doing pretty much what they think is best? Well, a lot of what developers spend their time doing right now, if you're in a, a big Fortune 500 company, is, has nothing to do with the actual business requirements of the application. You spend a lot of time just building the application, but then once you're done, you have all these other things that you have to do. So th these non-functional requirements of multi-tenancy, HA, scalability, those are things that you have to then go out to IT operations and talk to them and get their uh, approval. So as an example of this, you have your application. 
which you're packaging up in, in binaries in, in your build uh, services. And then you have to go to IT and you have to have a specifically configured application server and operating system that your uh, organization has as a default. And they typically use only one operating system or a few operating systems, and you only have to, you could only use that image. We're talking about a traditional Fortune 500. Then they have to set up the VMs. They typically over provision the VMs, so if they have more workload than, than needed, they don't have to go back and do that again. Then they have all these ancillary services that they have to set up around the application, including data, of course, and all the networking. So this takes a, quite a lot of time and involves a huge number amount of people. So when you actually add up you know, the handshakes that go in between this person and the other person, you're talking about you know, doing this on every single server and every single data center, and you're talking about a huge amount of time. So you expand that out, and you have it on production, and then all the different stages of production, QA, and test. And then for high availability, you double that up. And again, all the different handshakes where you primarily all you want to do is develop your application and get it into production, you have to go through the entire array of people in IT in order to get that application into production. And it's just not sustainable. It contributes to developer burnout. Yeah, we have developers at Apprenda who worked at large organizations and uh, the feeling that they got when half their time or 60% of their time was meeting with security teams and meeting with networking teams and meeting with DBAs. It's just not what they were trained to do. It's not what they, they want to do. They just want to code. It's error prone and creates fire drill solutions. Uh, so you could, you know, create something and then push it out and then something goes wrong and then it doesn't involve fixing it as a developer, it involves three or five different silo teams. It creates silos and snowflakes, so each instance of the application is different for each environment. If you wanted to, say, move that application to the public cloud, you'd that whole process all over again. And then it's an us versus them mentality. So it's us, the developers, versus the people in operations. But you could sort of bridge that with DevOps, but a lot of organizations have not come to fruition on that promise. So it's been a long search for the best compute abstraction in IT. Uh, there's actually a good talk about this two years ago that uh, Eric Schmidt gave at Google Next. I'd, uh, it's its keynote speak on all the different types of abstractions that Google has gone through the years from you know the very early stages where they were just using commodity hardware, but everything was on bare metal. They sort of skipped that VM part and went straight to containers, as we'll see. But they're at the point where developers just request resources, they get resources, and they can push changes. Oh. <laughs> Is the slide changing? There we go. So we're going to talk about containers today because they're fundamental to Kubernetes. Kubernetes is container management or container orchestration. Containers, the concept of containers or the roots of containers has been around for a very long time in a Linux kernel and other Linux-like systems. So everything from the early 70s where you had f uh, f uh, file name, uh, name spacing in the file system to BSD jails, if anybody remembers this, to probably what the first time you would consider a real container, which is Solaris zones. I don't know how many of you remember Sun and Solaris zones. They're actually still around. But it was a way to, compart to compartmentalize the actual application and process uh, that was different from virtualization and setting up a new operating system every single time. And since then, you have Linux C groups, which is something that was given to the Linux kernel actually through Google. And we'll actually see that Google never virtualized. They've always just done containers. And you just have an explosion since then. So LXC, Docker, who actually brought all this stuff together, Rocket. And this ends around 2016, I think that I made this slide. But we'll also s you also see Windows Server containers as well coming out in Windows Server 2016. So what is a container? 
you can think of it as two parts. One is isolation and one is resource management. So a container, when you actually just run the container on your laptop or wherever, it's just a process. It's a Linux process that you'll see uh, that you could actually you know, open up your process manager and, and see running. So it's separating itself from all the other processes on the actual Linux kernel. And it's doing this from all these different components that were already in a Linux kernel. Uh, things that you could actually build a container before Docker was around, but you'd have to scrap it together, and it was actually quite hard. There's also not only the process isolation, but also the resource management. So not only do you want to isolate one process from the other, but you also want to manage how much memory this process gets, how much CPU it gets, how much I.O., and so on and so forth. So these are things that were also in a Linux container. And taken together, these are what makes your container, your Linux container today. So what are the advantages of containers? For those of you that are not familiar with it, uh, you don't have to, they're much faster. They could spin up in you know, microseconds instead of a, you know, what you could do with a virtualization. Uh, you don't have to set up an operating system for each container. You just share a same operating system and each application is isolated from every other application. Um, the advantages of this is we went from servers and virtualized those servers and we consolidated the servers, but we're managing the same number of endpoints. With containers, we could actually hyper-consolidate and actually sometimes even do away with virtualization or rely a lot less on it, for sure. So before Docker, Linux, you could build your own Linux container. We did it at Apprenda for our software. Uh, actually, Docker did it before Docker at DocCloud. But you'd actually have to take all these different concepts that were in the Linux container and hobble them together to come up to some isolation and some resource management. Docker made this incredibly s simple to do. Uh, they came up with Docker files, a way to actually express uh, what the image of that container is. Then then came up with Docker images, which are similar to your virtualization images, and the actual containers. So now, instead of that whole process of, oh, this is my VM, this is my app server that we saw in the traditional enterprise, we're now just dealing with the application that's in the container. And we're just worrying about that and shipping that. So instead of then worrying about all the different snowflake um, instances that we have of this application in the, in the data center that we set up, what we're doing is we're just setting up a grid of orchestration software, container management software on all the different servers, and we're putting different applications, containerized applications, on those servers. So then, say, if a server goes out, oops, So if a server dies and the applications on, those, on that server obviously are no longer around, what the orchestration software can do, and we'll see this in Kubernetes, can move those applications, instances of those applications to the other servers. So you're no longer worried about high availability or scalability of your application. That's all taken care of by the platform. So containers are great, but they're not the end-all be-all of modern application development. You need a whole lot more. You need the configuration management, the security, uh, the ability to ship the containers, to build them. So the system that we'll talk about today is one example of, of this, and it comes out of our friends from Google who have always been using application, uh, sorry, containers. So Google spins up 2 billion new containers per week, uh, which is a phenomenal number. They don't, those containers are not around for weeks or months at a time. Most of them are ephemeral. They are up for microseconds and then die. They've done 15 years of container orchestration research. Uh, internally, they use a system called Borg and Omega, which is all containerized, container orchestration and container management. Uh, if you're interested in what Google uses internally in the Borg system, uh, you could listen to the Google Cloud podcast. One of the engineers, the original engineers that built Borg uh, was on there, and it's an amazing interview when he talks about how they came up with the system and it just worked so well that everybody started to adopt it. But the thing about Borg is that it's tied into Google. 
It has a lot of things that only Google could use. And there are things that they would like to have internally that they're not able to adopt. So it's almost like the legacy even at Google. So an example of this that uh, we'll see la later is actually labels. You're familiar with labels from your Gmail, where you can label any email, anything you want. You'll see those in, in Kubernetes come up. They tried to actually put those into Borg into their internal system, but weren't able to do it. So when they came up with Kubernetes, or they were able to take all, everything that they learned from this 15 years of container orchestration, research, and R&D, and put it into this new system that they were building. So, and the other thing about Google is all the distributed system DNA that they have. If you, if you think about all the distributed systems that we talk about today from C groups, which is you know, one of the primary things that we use to isolate applications and containers, to artificial intelligence, to MapReduce, which is what Hadoop is based on, to Bigtable, which a lot of the distributed databases are based on, a lot of that came out of Google. They used to write papers and then people took those papers and made their own systems, their own open source systems. But what we're seeing now is that Google, a lot of times, will not only write a paper, but actually open source what they're working on. And the, uh, Kubernetes is an example of that. So uh, just to give you a sense of what the Google scale is, they have 30,000 developers, uh, 1 billion files, and over 80,000 builds per day. It's just humongous. Uh, it's the largest, uh, you know, compute infrastructure in the world, obviously. So enter Kubernetes, um, what we'll be talking about today. We'll be talking about the different components of Kubernetes, the use cases of Kubernetes, and the Kubernetes community. So this is came out of you know that constructs that we saw in Borg and, and container orchestration. And this is something that's open source that you could use right now. So use cases of different of Kubernetes, which is uh, container orchestration, you see two primary use cases, which on one end, you see IT building container as a service, where they internally, as an IT team, what they're doing is they're going to build this service that many different developer teams can use. You see a, l a large number of organizations using that. And then they have to decide, are they going to go to the self-managed route, where they build it themselves, or are they going to go with public cloud? The other thing, and I think this is the more popular use case for Kubernetes, is that you see a lot of developer teams uh, taking their application and wanting to modernize it, containerize it, whatever you want to call it. They are then looking for ways to do that, and the number one way that they're doing that right now is with Kubernetes. And you see that an explosion of that in the market. So why did we pick Kubernetes? We looked at all the different cloud-native technologies that were out there, and we thought there were three big differentiators that we saw. One is that it's open source, and it's based on this you know, 15 years of Google R&D that they've done. And it's a huge community with thou over 1,000 developers on GitHub and so on. It's battle-tested, so it's used by many organizations already, and it's used in Google's public cloud, in Azure's public cloud, and in now IBM Bluemix public cloud. So there's that as well. And it's the market leader. And a few statistics on to show you that it's the market leader. This actually comes from uh, the new stack. If you're familiar with that publication, they asked uh, what container orchestration technology are you currently investigating or using? And Kubernetes on the bottom over there is by far number one. This is from two different OpenStack summits, two years apart. The, the one on your left, if you're facing there, is from 2015. Uh, the one on your right is from 2017. You could see that Kubernetes currently trumps everything. And then from just Google search analytics as well, you'll see that Kubernetes is four times as popular as any other option out there. And so I did a SWOT analysis as well. I mean, obviously, I'm biased because I love Kubernetes. But, <laughs> but beyond that bias, I think it is still a good uh, rundown of all the benefits I saw in Kubernetes and why we adopted it and chose to back it. So if you follow that URL, you could get to the SWOT analysis. OK, so now we're going to go into the meat of Kubernetes and the actual components of Kubernetes. Um, during the workshop, there's typically a lot of questions on each one of the components. So if you have any questions, I guess just save them to the end, and I'll answer them there. So this is the Kubernetes architecture. Uh, it involves an etcd, 
uh, nodes, which are uh, sort of the single source of truth of Kubernetes, master nodes and, and worker nodes. If you look online for Kubernetes architectures, you're going to see many different diagrams. I really like the one that the way that this is set up, uh, and it's just very easy to understand. So the etcd node, this is, as I said before, this is the single source of truth for Kubernetes. How many of you have ever used something like Zookeeper before? So zoo very similar to Zookeeper. It's just a, a, a different, it uses a different algorithm called the Raft, Raft algorithm. If you're interested in what how the Raft algorithm works, you can look it up online. There's a really good site. I think I have it in there. No, I do not. But um, this is actually uh, the brains of Kubernetes or the memory of Kubernetes. This has the state of your cluster. And you need to set up uh, between uh, one and five of these uh, for your Kubernetes cluster, depending if it's you know Skunk Works or just for development or for production. Uh, and it's just a key value store. And you have to set them up in odd numbers. So one, three, or five, because the leader election, the way that it's done, you just like you need an odd number of Supreme Court justices. So this is actually the funniest thing I've ever seen on Twitter. Uh, someone asked, why is my Kubernetes cluster not working? And the answer was, you don't have an odd number of master nodes, and it literally can, can't even, which means that, again, you need to have an odd number of, of the actual master nodes. So diving in, that's the etcd part of Kubernetes. Now we're going to talk about the master part of Kubernetes and all the different components in the master. So the first component we'll be talking about is the API server. So the API server, you're not going to talk to each one of these components in the Kubernetes cluster. What you'll be talking to is the API server when you're writing your command lines or whatever. This is the mouth of Kubernetes. So all your commands are going to this, and then this goes out and talks to all the different components. It's a single entry point to the, to the system. Uh, for more information, you can follow that URL. How are we on time? The second component I'm going to talk about in the master node is the controller manager. So the controller manager, uh, there's several different controllers that you could have in Kubernetes, and I list some of them here. There's replica, there's a replication controller, there's replica sets, there's endpoint controllers, there's stateful sets. Uh, so there's many different controllers. Uh, later on, I'll be talking about uh, the replica sets, in, and you'll see an example of that. But this is the, the process that's deciding where your application is going and, and, how it's, uh, and if it's healthy. The third component in the master node is the scheduler. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with what a scheduler is. It's almost self-descriptive of what a scheduler does. It's scheduling where your application is falling and um, putting it out into the different worker nodes by policy and by a few other quality insurance assurances that it has. So we learned about the etcd node. That's the brain of Kubernetes, or the memory of Kubernetes. We learned about the master node, which is the real brain of Kubernetes. Um, you need a few etcd nodes. You need a few master nodes. We're going to go on to now to the worker nodes. So you have a few of these, a few of those. You could have thousands of these, the worker nodes. These are things that you put on commodity arc, uh, infrastructure that you expect to die, right? These, these are things that everything in here should be ephemeral. Like the applications that you put on there, you're just expecting them to, to one day not you know, die and then come up some, somewhere else. So in the worker nodes, uh, the most important part is the kubelet. This is where all the magic happens. This is what is putting a pod, which is a concept we'll talk about a little bit later, but you can think of that. It's one or more containers onto the worker node. Uh, so it is an agent that's actually setting up your application or your application components. There's a kube proxy, which is the networking. We'll talk a little bit about the networking when we talk about the features of Kubernetes, but it's how all the different worker nodes talk to each other, and it's a very flat networking, we'll see. And so that's the different components of Kubernetes. Again, you have the etcd nodes, the master nodes, and the worker nodes. You also have load balancers and uh, the command line. That thing on all the way on the left is called kubectl. Don't let anybody tell you it's pronounced differently. It's called kubectl. 
So that's the architecture, which we went over incredibly fast. Again, this is a one day workshop down to 45 minutes. <laughs> so now we'll be talking about pods. Pods are the most basic concept in Kubernetes. This is actually what is being orchestrated in Kubernetes, is this pod. What it is, is one or more containers that have some affinity to it towards each other. So why do you need that? Say you have, you, you want to package, oh, I can't go, go, go out of the light. The IT guys will get mad at me. They're like Obi-Wan Kenobi. They don't want me to go to the dark side. So all these different components of, say, the front end or the data, like th the example that's typically giving is like an Nginx server and a Git synchronizer, right? So you want those things to fall on the same infrastructure. You don't want them in different sides of the data center or on different sides of the IT stack. So the concept of a pod is one or more containers that are packaged up together that will be orchestrated and scale together. They share a namespace, so all the different containers in, in the pod can see each other. They also share a networking, uh, and we'll see more about Kubernetes networking in a little bit. And they're the most fundamental unit of management of all, all of Kubernetes. Again, this is what you're scaling when you actually use Kubernetes in the second part of this training or workshop, you actually see the pods and see them scale. And they're a set of related, tightly coupled containers. So that's the concept of a pod. Pod networking is extremely flat. There's no NAT. So those of you that are familiar with Docker and port wrangling, there's none of that in Kubernetes. You don't worry about that. And so each pod can talk to another pod or all the other pods. Uh, and it's routable layer three. So it's an extremely flat networking. They all each get their own internal IP address that they could talk to each other with. So now, I mentioned this before, labels. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about labels in Kubernetes. Uh, labels, again, are the same thing that you're using in your, uh, in your Gmail. They're just a piece of metadata that you could assign to any email. Here, you're assigning them to the different pods. So I could say that this pod is equal to the portal, or this pod is equal to the front end tier, or this is equal to V1. And you can label them however you want. What we suggest to our customers is that you have some taxonomy that you label your pods at. But we'll see why this is important later. Um, more important than maybe even labels is the concept of selectors. So all these pods are now labeled whatever you wanted to label them. And now we're able to pick out the labels that we want by doing almost like a SQL qu query, which we call a selector. So if I want all the, all the labels where app is equal to portal, I could do that in Kubernetes, and it, it would give me all these pods. But say I want all the pods that are e where app is equal to portal, but version is equal to one, it's able to do that as well. So now you see I'm just limiting it to pod A and pod C. So those are labels. I talked a little bit about, about controllers in the architecture. So in controllers, there's something called replica sets, which is putting out the, the pods or of your application and actually scaling them. Um, and in Kubernetes, it almost uses the Linux concept where it does something minimal, but it does it really well. So that's all it's doing. It's, it's just replicating the actual instances of your application. So that's a replica set. But there's also something called the deployment because, uh, you know, again, you have this Unix concept where it's, you know, the most basic concept, but then you want to build on top of it. So you need to also have a deployment as well because maybe you have two different versions of this application. Right here we see only A, but maybe you wanted to do a rolling deployment to the second version of the application. Uh, and you need to have a deployment concept in there because all the replica sets, they don't have a concept of this is replica A versus replica B. You need deployment in there to change from A to B in your rolling deployments. So that's what a deployment does. So controllers in Kubernetes. Uh, controllers are, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, desired state configuration management. If you are, that's what this controller is doing. So you define how many instances of an application you want. Say I want four instances of my application out there. And you're letting Kubernetes actually schedule that application to all the different 
uh, infrastructure. So an example of this is, say I wanted four replicas of this application on, on my infrastructure. We have four different nodes here. So I said replica is equal to four. But what happens if one of the servers goes down? You could see that the four is no longer equal to the three, the actual state. And so it's going to reconcile that. It's actually going to take that application and move it to another piece of the infrastructure so that the desired state is equal to the current state. And that's co it's in a constant loop. A, a good example of this is when uh, they actually first talked about Borg. Uh, there's a good YouTube on this where uh, the engineer actually launched a million Hello Worlds. So there was a million Hello Worlds that he launched onto Google's infrastructure, probably not a good use of Google's infrastructure, if you ask me or anybody. Uh, but what happened is it got up to 997 versions of that Hello World. So why did it only go up to 997? Well, because servers were kept on dying. There's a lot of Hello Worlds out there, right? But what was going on is that this Replica, uh, this controller was constantly searching for more servers that it could launch this hello world to. So it was this fight between the desired state and the actual state of your application. And it's just an ongoing loop. So we learned about pods, one or more containers. We learned about labels, which is just a metadata that you attach to uh, these pods. And we learned about the control manager. So now we're going to get to the concept of a microservice which is services in Kubernetes. What it is is just we saw those selectors in, in, uh, in the labels where you could just do almost like a SQL query and say, I want this particular set of, of labels. That is what defines a service in Kubernetes. So why do you need services in Kubernetes? Well, the reason is because these pods are supposed to be ephemeral. They're supposed to, you know, Put, be put out into the infrastructure, infrastructure's dying. So if you were routing traffic to those different pods individually, uh, you would have changing IP addresses, you would have just a mess. So you need the concept of a service which has a static, stable IT, IP address that is cluster-wide that many different services that you are hosting on your infrastructure can then go and see. It also has cluster-wide DNS, which is also important for the exa same exact reasons. So now, for instance, if you wanted to get more instances of, of your application, more pods of your application, you're just hitting the same IP address. You're just hitting the same DNS entry. So that's services and microservices in Kubernetes. Uh, ingress. Uh, so. The concept of services is sort of a lower la layer networking concept in Kubernetes. Uh, for HTTP traffic, there's the concept of ingress. So this is actually how you're routing uh, internet traffic to each one of your services, your microservices in Kubernetes. So how do we install Kubernetes? So there's a the manual way. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, Kelsey Hightower wrote a GitHub called Kubernetes the Hard Way. You could go follow that. Uh, and if you want to learn about every single component in Kubernetes, that's the best way to do it. Uh, but it's quite hard. You'll probably get to step six, screw up, and say, oh, crap, I'm, I don't know what to do now. Uh, you could use configuration management. So things like Ansible, Chef, Puppet. There's a whole bunch of tools out here. Uh, what you'll find is that those tools are obviously written for a specific version of Kubernetes and for a specific environment that Kubernetes is being set up upon. Set up on. Uh, the third way is the easy button. So there's uh, many different easy buttons in Kubernetes now. And this was a big thing after Docker came out with Docker Swarm, and it was very incredibly easy to use. The Kubernetes community hunkered down and actually came up with many different versions of the easy button in Kubernetes. So uh, the first version, easy way you could do the easy button is public cloud. Uh, this is extremely easy. Uh, there's three public clouds that I know of that use Kubernetes. Uh, one is obviously Google Container Engine. The second one is uh, Azure Container Service. And the third one is uh, Bluemix, which is, I believe, in beta. But you know we'll go into production sooner or later. Uh, Kismatic Enterprise Toolkit, which is an open source thing that we create 
that we built for our customers that have servers behind the firewall that don't have access to the internet. This is not something that we sell. It's completely open source. There's no price point attached to it. But we needed a way to set up Kubernetes behind the corporate firewall. Uh, there's COPS, which is an awesome way to set up Kubernetes on AWS. Uh, there's Kube ADM, which was maybe one of the first versions of an easy button. And then there's obviously the vendor distros that uh, people are familiar with, like the OpenShift, the CoreOS's, the Apprentice Cloud platforms, uh, where uh, they have their advantages and their disadvantages as well. OK, so you're just a developer. You don't care about any of this. How do I just get started with Kubernetes? So the easiest way to get started is with Minikube. You won't learn about any of that architecture stuff that we we saw the slides on, but you'll be able to run the command lines. So this is you know, probably the easiest way to run it on your laptop. It's a single command line to, to get it up and running. Single command line if you're on Mac or Linux. It is probably two or three page instructions if you're on Windows. <laughs> but I have them written out. I did it because we do workshops, and I want everybody to have a running Kubernetes cluster. So if you're interested in running Kubernetes Minikube on Windows, talk to me and we'll cry together. Um, so public Kubernetes clouds, I already talked about this. There's three different versions. Uh, these are incredibly easy to use as well. And then there's online walkthroughs. So now that you have it set up on Minikube or using your public cloud or you set it up with COPS or, or whatever, um, uh, we did these, so th the first two are actually the trainings and workshops that you know, this is a very, very condensed version of and just the PowerPoints. So if you go there, we have the step-by-step -step instructions to get the actual cluster up and working and to put applications up and running on it. And those applications we built to actually show you the features of Kubernetes. So you could actually see the scalability. You kill like nodes. It's really cool. Um, you could join the Kubernetes community. That's, I believe, a link to the Slack. Actually, it just says here, because I'm an idiot. I'll put, there, there is a Kubernetes Slack, and that it's not, H-E-R-E. -E. Uh, you could join the Kubernetes portal. Uh, this is like a gamification so you, that if you contribute to Kubernetes, you get prizes, and it's awesome. And then uh, there's a cheat sheet as well, which obviously I'm an idiot. I also did not put the URL. I just put here, because typically I just put these in the Slack where people could click on them. Um, there's also. This just came out with Kubernetes by example. It's actually something that Red Hat put together. Um, and it goes through, it's almost like, if anybody's familiar with Go by example, a uh, very similar concept. Let's you take pictures. And then again, we do lots of workshops, which I swear <laughs> are a lot longer and more hands-on than this and less PowerPoints. And then I explain the PowerPoints with much more vigor and longer than I did here. But we have ones that we do with Cisco, which are at their field offices. We have ones that we do with Apprenda that focus more on the public cloud, uh, that are at the Google offices. We do ones with Google and Intel, which are focused on if you wanted to set up hybrid Kubernetes on-prem and in the public cloud. Uh, and then there's Cisco Cloud Days as well. Oh, more pictures. So I'm with that. Does anybody have any questions? You got to do it in 40 seconds. <laughs> I'm trying to make it quick. Um, my question is regarding the uh, persistence layer of Kubernetes, which was at SD, um, can we, since it's using Raft, can we use console instead? No. And, okay, no. yeah, because they also use Raft. No. And uh, console is kind of more like a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to see what your opinion is. Okay, thank you. No, you, you can. It's, it, it's like those other things like console and Zookeeper, but you can't use console and Zookeeper. It's, and it's, it's sort of orthogonal to the other concepts in Kubernetes. So there's, there's people like if you saw McClucky yesterday and Joe Beta who would like to actually break that out, but that's a community decision that's not being made in this room. But as, as of right now, you can only use that CD. Okay, any other questions for Chris? Chris, thank you very much. Thanks.